wonderful guest for you all tonight. And my special guest this evening is Gerald R. Clark. And Gerald Clark is a 1994 graduate of the University of California at San Diego, UCSD. Gerald holds an MSEE in electronic circuits and systems and is a BS and a BS in computer engineering, both from UCSD. Gerald is the author of several papers in the communications and electronics field and is well known for his work in the San Diego high technology industry, awarded several patents in the free space optical laser communications field while serving as vice president of engineering, LightPoint Communications Incorporated. Gerald's career involved companies like Laurel Telemetry and Instrumentation, where he led the final phase of the Global Star Telemetry and Command Modern Modem, excuse me, designed for Qualcomm, used to command, monitor, and control 54 LEO Global Star Constellation satellites. While serving as VP Engineering at Duran Communications, Gerald and his small team of hardware and software engineers were credited with the digitizing American television, having demonstrated the first live HD TV ABC Monday Night Football game on an air transmission from New York to San Diego using Tiernan Communications Incorporated, HDTV 18, 1080i 720p MPEG-2 encoders. And during the years 1996 through 2002, working as a telecommunications executive, Gerald's business travels took him to various parts of the world, exposing him to a plethora of cultures, which acted as a catalyst for his research into mankind's earliest technologies and accomplishments, including the cultures of Mesopotamia and the surrounding areas of Turkey, Egypt, per Persia, and Iraq eventually leading to the cuneiform inscribed tablets left by the Sumerians. Knowledge of the Anunnaki here on Earth, both in the ancient past, their present here and now, is being fully disclosed around the world. His hope is that this book will help the billions of primitive workers left to fend for themselves on a hostile planet to find hope that following the great destruction underway, brought by the warring gods of light and dark, a promised peace in the new age of Aquarius is dawning, actually already upon us. <clears throat> Excuse me, Gerald has a new book, Seventh, Seventh Planet Mercury Rising, which I love that title available on his website as signed and also on amazon.com. Let's not forget his other wonderful book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru. His website is www.geraldclark77.com. Please welcome Gerald R. Clark to the show this evening. Good evening. Hey, it's really great to be here with you, and I want to wish all your listeners a warm, warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on board with us tonight, and I can't wait to dive into your new book, and I have to say, I love the title, Seventh Planet, Mercury Rising. That's that's just classic. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you, it sounds like a sci-fi movie. It's really good. Uh, where did you get that title from? Oh, I'd, I'd love to tell you the story. So uh, it, tur it, it actually came to me in pieces, and I won't make it too long, but uh, I was actually getting like this uh, weird set of synchronicities that started September 1st, 2013, after writing The Anunnaki of Nibiru. And it happened for 12 days in a row. And one of the things that came out of that strange experience was three quarters of the title for the book. And it had a lot to do with the, the substance mercury. It kept showing up symbolically. And uh, I got invited to go gold mining up in the Sierras. And it turned out that mercury ended up being the forefront of the issue as the miners were being blamed for stirring up mercury in the, in the riverbeds and poisoning the, the fish, right? <laughs> so, so it kept coming up. So one thing led to another. And in my research, I found in the Enuma Elish that the uh, Anunnaki had named the planets based on from the outside in. And in their telling of this story, this allegorical battle of these planets that were vying for position in the solar system, which they were trapped in, they named uh, all the planets and gave them their position. And it turned out they called Earth the planet Ki, K-I, and that its position was number seven. So I, I thought it would be interesting to, to tell the story of the Anunnaki from the seventh planet prison, <laughs> a, a primitive worker perspective, mm -hmm. and also through the eyes of the one who was affiliated with that planet who shows up in that account. And that was Mercury, Hermes, Ningshida. He has many, many names, but uh, he was a, he was an epic figure in that Enuma Elish. And so I kind of adopted looking into some of his writings and used his perspective and my perspective to tell that story in the seventh planet Mercury rising. And one of the, one of the, one of the very key questions I, I wanted to answer for people when they finally read the first book and got over the shock that perhaps an alien race had something to do with our genetic origins, if they got good with that finally, the, the next question that comes up with, for them is they start trying to piece together the dimensional hierarchy. Well, where do they fit in? How do they fit in with our concept of a creator or a creator of all? And so that also was a central focus of the second book 
was to expose who the Anunnaki thought was quote unquote God and how they saw them, their race and our civilization in relationship to that creative force. Right. That, and and we, that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and also we are, according to your information, we are descendants of the Anunnaki, correct? Yes. Yeah, so that, that doesn't mean that there weren't many other races that have visited the planet, played genetic mm -hmm. games and things like that. I just happened to choose the Anunnaki because they were the last ones in the record that I seem to have definitive information that it was their DNA that went into the zygote of a, or the ovum of a female bipedal hominid on this planet. So I focused on them. That doesn't mean <laughs> they, that they didn't continue to iterate with genetic experiments and that others were probably cordoning off a subclass of the populace and doing other experiments as well. Mm -hmm. so, but but so so the Anunnaki don't stand alone in this story at all, right? Exactly. Well, well, for the listeners, and I'm pretty sure we have a pretty savvy audience here, but I, I'd like to go into a depth of what the Anunnaki are. Who are they? Where where is their essence of origin? Um, can can we start there? Sure. We we have various sources, and you have to understand before you pin them to one planet and say that's where they're from. Mm -hmm. These are these are galactic colonizers, and they have set up bases on other planets, other moons. So. If you knew exactly where the point in history was that you could say, okay, where are they from? I'll try to do that because they did give that to us in the Enuma Elish. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is their epic of creation. And in that account, they seem to indicate to us, and I put this in both my books with my breakdown, is that they came from another solar, solar system that was close by to ours. And at some, for some reason, which I believe was the perturbation caused by going through the galactic center for our solar system and possibly theirs at the same time. If, that, if something happened at that junction and their, their small solar system got entrapped in our solar system, this is what they say in the story. And their solar system ended up in a retrograde orbit around our sun. Okay, And they had a planet which by the time we got cuneiform tablets and got this story in Babylon, there's other versions of the story, but the old Babylonian version had already been, I guess you would say, editorially changed to put the deity of Babylon's name in for the planet of origin that they came from. So he called it Marduk in that account. But uh, Marduk was related to one of the other beings in the account, and we know quite well that the home planet was not named Marduk. It was named in many other documents, and they called it Nibiru. Mm-hmm. Correct. Right. And, yeah. and uh, the Bible and many other documents have called it many other things. And science is calling it everything from planet nine to planet X to <laughs> Herculobus to the, you know, Wormwood. So, but I think, uh, I think uh, it's safe to say that from the Enuma Elish account that they came from a planet that had multiple satellites around it. They were probably geothermally heated or working with some sort of Dyson sphere around their planet if they were that far away from our inner sun, even though they had their own central sun it appears that it was a dark sun or a brown dwarf we're not really quite sure um, um carlos ferrada wrote about this in the 50s and he published a map calling it herculobus and it sat approximately according to him about 35 billion miles from our sun stationary um, and according to dr Neug neugebauer in 1981 in the paper when they first used the um, satellites, the IRS satellite, to locate Planet X or whatever was perturbing Neptune, mm -hmm. he stated he thought it was 50 billion miles away and not moving. So it's very possible that their brown dwarf sun doesn't move, but their inner planets move around their sun just like ours do. And there may be some overlap in the trajectory. <laughs> or mm -hmm. one of their planets may be roaming between the two suns at a foci uh, and then returning. So that seems to be the periodicity that they described in a retrograde orbit around our sun. So in the account, um, and I, I hopefully I don't spend too much time on the Enuma Elish, but this is kind of the, like the fundamental starting place for the Anunnaki story. Uh, in their account, the first time through, according to the Enuma Elish, um, they had to do some things to the inner planets in order to prevent collisions. And I thought that was very, very interesting because it kind of unveiled the level and extent to which they had technology even then. Mm -hmm. Very, very significant planet splitting technology. Okay. So the idea of an atomic bomb here is probably a joke to them. Right. And the fact that it was traveling in retrograde orbit indicates that they had a mobile observatory and they could have seen every planet we had in our inner solar system by going the opposite direction. Of course, that, there's the danger of running into it. But so in their account, the first time through, 
They made some uh, manipulations of the inner solar system, including masking the radiance of the sun and playing around with Mercury, which I thought was very interesting. The second go around, they had a collision. And this was described as one of their satellites having an impact with the planet Tiamut. Well, Tiamut was the, the pla is a planet which is located approximately where our Earth is now. It was struck, parts of it were broken off and, and created the asteroid belt. And then uh, the coalescence of that became our Earth, which they called Ki. But before that, they called it Tiamut. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to got too kind of deep into where they're from. I do believe they have affiliations with Sirius, the Sirius constellation, and the Orion constellation. Well, because some of their edifices they've built, they've aligned them to these, uh, trying to you know show you <laughs> show you where they're from. So I think that, like I said, as galactic colonizers, I think they're in multiple locations, and mm -hmm. they were fac factionalized as well. And before we get too deep in this, before everybody starts going, well, which one's the good one and which one's the bad mm -hmm. one? Right. I kind of want to say something about that because I've done this so many times. Okay. Um, imagine uh, that the United States or some other government did something to another country, lodged a missile over their border, and, and they were viewed as just horrible for doing this, right? Well, mm -hmm. it would be ludicrous to say that the people that lived in that country were all evil and bad because of what the government did, right? Well, it's no different in a population of us or another civilization. It's all made up of individuals who have free choice. So when I say that they, that Anunnaki had personalities from serial killers to saying that goes for all of them, and that goes for us too. So, so the idea of wanting to go, okay, this one's on the good team, that one's the bad one, I should worship this one and not divide that one. Just be careful, okay? Because it's it's not that it's not that clear cut and dried. And you can't throw them all under the bus and go, well, they were all fallen angels, so uh, they they must be demons, right? That's what the religious mm -hmm. right does. So, right. uh, <clears throat> okay. So with yeah. that said, um, I hope I answered your question about where oh, I did. think they came from. Okay. Yeah, you did. And my question to you also is I'm under the impression that, uh, supposedly, um, from what I understand, I don't want to call it planet X, but Nibiru is on its way back here. Uh, now is there a timeline with that? What's your, what's your take on the timeline insofar as its arrival goes? Well, when I wrote my first book, I, I basically adopted some early research historically saying, well, this seemed to have happened on the earth. Therefore, we think it, there was a passage at that point at 3,600 years to that. And that's the return date. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. The problem was, how could you prove that that was a passage date? So, so uh, I didn't really pay that much attention to it when I first wrote the book, but it kept coming up later uh, in the year. So about May of 2015, I was uh, asked by Capricorn Radio to spend some time and come up with a status report of what I thought the best case situation or what's going on, because I had written a book about it, right? So I felt responsible. Anyway, um, so I did that, and I came at it from many, many different angles, uh, looking at passage point possibilities, uh, along with uh, mathematical predictions using the IRAS data that was given to us by Dr. Harrington in 1981 and 1990. And I'm kind of a scientist at heart, so I, re I, I went down the pathway of looking at the, um, the um, Sumerian kings list, because they mention a flood account in there, and mm -hmm. I tried working forwards into it to see if that was our great flood, working backwards. Those dates did not match the flood that we call, oh, I guess the Ice Age flood that happened around uh, 10,950 or about 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, Very I think I lost I think I lost track of where I was going with that question. You, you had, give me, give me the, the scope of the question. Again, well, no, I was just, I was just wondering what your perception is insofar as the arrival. Oh, oh you time. want a timeline? You want a timeline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So I wrote this report. Uh, it got very detailed. I ended up uh, relying heavily on the mathematics that was given to and the uh, data that was given to us by Dr. Neugebauer and Dr. Harrington, who was kind of famous. He was the United States uh, chief scientist at the Naval Observatory at Washington D.C. Uh, at the time that he did a video talking about where he thought this perturber of Neptune was, <laughs> okay? And they had very, very good data. As a matter of fact, he he was responsible for commissioning the Voyager and the Pioneer satellites to go and actually see it on uh, incoming toward perihelion and outbound toward uh, aphelion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I used that data. I did a I did kind of what you would call a blink test to determine its velocity. If you knew where it was, you knew the velocity, you'd know when it arrived. And I simply used that data, put out a report in May of 2015, and the data showed me that it could be anywhere from 
the summer of 2015 to about the first quarter of 2017. So I, I couldn't really pick a date because we didn't have enough information. We didn't, you know, unless you have the the uh, the mass and several other factors about the object that you're observing, and especially its or its its orbital path, you can't mm -hmm. determine its speed because it changes as it gets closer into perihelion depending on what angle it's coming at. It. Like, there's a lot of factors. And for that matter, it's not a clock, okay? This, this periodicity that they mentioned for their counting of time was done in a char. That's what they list in the Sumerian Kings list. And these are um, intervals of 3,600 years. And every Sumerian Kings list before the first flood uh, is his term limits are listed in shars, okay? And if you add them up and count them, it comes out at exactly 3,600 years. Mm -hmm. So yep. this, this, but I don't think you can use that as a clock and go, well, exactly 3,600 years, you know, the, their planet's going to return, come around our sun, <clears throat> and then exit again. Uh, there looks to be a variability based, based on atmospheric density changes and debris and particles that could be up to plus or minus 50 years. So the idea of somebody could go, well, looks like, you know, Virgo is going to be, or uh, Jupiter is going to be in Virgo in this day, and therefore it's going to pass that day. I think that's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Right. So it may have done it in the past. It doesn't mean it's going to do it again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. with that said, my timeline hasn't really changed. I'm, we're in the first quarter of 2017. And my other prediction was that if it does appear in the sky, because of the ramifications of not having told the people that that might happen, and the mm -hmm. surface condition changes that could occur with it, that they would probably start a world war as they grab surface resources, oil, gold, petroleum, anything that the, they would need whenever they came back out of their bunkers and wanted to reestablish their new world order or whatever they're up to. But mm -hmm. that would occur simultaneously with the with uh, the effects of Nibiru appearing. Well, I think that I think that could very well be happening. I I. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, <laughs> I put myself on a limb when I say things like this, but uh, I watched cer certain physical things. And recently, I guess it was two or three days ago, there were seven volcanoes that erupted simultaneously within a two hour period of each other. And I'm wow. talking big ones, Mount Etna, Kalima, and several others. And I'm like, wow, okay, something is perturbing the earth. And it's not sure. mankind running around blowing carbon in the atmosphere. Okay. That's, that's ludicrous. So Something is doing that, and I would suspect that there, if there were electromagnetic interactions and gravity interactions with a large body coming into our solar system, that would be the first thing we'd experience is tugging mm -hmm. on, the, on our planet. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense right there. <laughs> well, it certainly looks like we have some things going on insofar as a possible war breaking out, so that's another thing that's correlating as oh, well. Man. Oh, man. I, you know, it touches me kind of deeply. Uh, when I was 21 years old, I finally got my dream answered, and I got a flight slot to go fly helicopters in the Army. Mm, wow. I got, I got deployed to uh, South Korea mm. uh, at Camp Page in, <clears throat> in Chuncheon, which is very close to the demilitarized zone. So I lived in Korea for a year, visited the DMZ, right up to the building that was separated along the 38th parallel where the guards were standing up, you know, with their with their shotguns. And mm -hmm. the room split in half right where the DMZ went right through the middle of the building. <laughs> it wow. was absolutely crazy. I've been there. Well, I knew at some point in the future that that situation could not hold. And in 2015, when I wrote The Seven Planet Mercury Rising, I included a prediction in there on page 421 that the KMS-3-2 satellite that was allowed to orbit over the United States would probably be equipped with some sort of heavy metal darts if they wanted to use them to create an EMP. And I think uh, that may be something that they plan. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense strategically for a small country like that to be fighting against a large giant that's threatening them. Mm -hmm. They would have to use asymmetrical things to try to fight back. And I think that would be one of them. I think you're absolutely correct. And also, it seems like I'm wondering if they're doing some some tests over here when you were talking about the, uh, you know, the power being out here and there. I'm wondering if that was a test or something, you know, off air. We were touching on that a little bit. With yeah, well, it, yeah, if you just noticed that the, the gas line started in North Korea because of all the threats. Um, mm -hmm. and, and troops showing up on the northern border, 150,000 from China and many, many, many uh, forces from Russia along the North Korean border as well. Right. So uh, that that scare probably caused the government to go, OK, well, if you're going to cause lines in our country, we'll just go disrupt your uh, <laughs> your transportation system. Because it does not look like it would have been a solar flare or something like that that would have caused an EMP it, when it was distributed on one side of the coast and not in the other and not everything in between. So that tells me it was more likely a hack attack. 
where the dense population of the United States is, and you know, like up California and the North and San Francisco and New York area. And that's, that's exactly right. where it happened. So yeah, that's a very good assessment you make right there. I can tell you're pretty super intelligent. So that's it's nice communicating with you about this. It is very concerning that we are in very strange times, and um, your your work does correlate on so many different levels because it's it's almost multifaceted. I mean, we're dealing with things on the linear world, but then we're dealing with things on a bigger scale as well. And and let me ask you real quick before we hit the break about Nibiru itself. It reminds me of something that's almost like it's under intelligent control. Maybe not even a planet, but an orbiting station of some kind. Do you, do you get that, or is it literally a planet? Well, it's a good question. I think originally it was a planet, but the way that they're able to manipulate orbits of satellites and planets, mm -hmm. it's like they're playing it's like they're playing checkers with planets up there and changing their orbits and things. Do you think mm -hmm. it's coincidence that Venus and the, and the Earth have a phi ratio if you divide them? That's not by no. coincidence. No. That, that's not just, it's just a, none of the other ones have it. <laughs> so why is Venus so important, you know? Well, it Absolutely. turns out that that is an important planet and they oftentimes affiliated themselves well, the god, the gods affiliated themselves with a planet, and that shows up in my genealogy table. I know you got a break coming up, so uh, we do. Okay, and we'll be yeah, we're gonna have a break. We're gonna continue on this conversation. Everybody, you listen to Hyperspace at KCR Digital Radio Network, live out of Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Solaris Blair, and my wonderful guest tonight is Gerald Clark. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody, to Hyperspace here at KCR Digital Radio Network, live out of Las Vegas, Nevada. I am your host, Solaris Clearvin. My wonderful guest tonight is Gerald Clark. And, and Gerald, before we hit the break, they were just touching up or finishing up a little bit on on what was going on with Nibiru. And and also, before we, we uh, switch gears a little bit, I was going to ask you what the correlation is with Antarctica, or you have any impression about Antarctica and the connection to Nibiru. Um. I've been looking at it. The, the best correlations I have are based on the, the information that was written by Robert Byrd, I believe. And he, uh, he clearly had some encounter uh, on the base in 1948, I believe it was, right after the Roswell incident, which was 47, with his 5,000 crew armada that uh, was going down to route the, the, the um, bases that have supposedly been set up by the Germans. Well... In his diary, he mentioned that account that they were attacked by some sort of alien craft. So there's there's some advanced technology that whether we copied it from another race or the other races there is not really clear to me. But I do think that uh, b because of his writings about the um, uh, Arctic Pole, he had an encounter there as well, which was even more telling than the South Pole, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. where it seems to me he had an encounter with some of the benevolent Anunnaki, the one of one of which I believe was Ningshita Thoth, the one he called the master, which warned him about the military and industrial complex that if they kept going down this path, that uh, they were going to be destroyed. And we did it anyway. So I think I think we've uh, we've sown our own seeds of destruction, and, and it's coming to pass. Um, as far as uh, the geography of the Antarctic, I think because of its position. And the North Pole, I think that because you're talking about a planet that's spinning about its axis and we've seen through torsion field effect physics that it builds up energy at the poles when you have that situation, that there's probably some advantageous entry or, a or exit uh, facility because of that ex excess energy at the poles that these aliens are using or extraterrestrials or even or even really smart terrestrial humans that are part of the deep space program that are, you know. That are right. checking out either way, but there's there's something magical about that, and I think it has some a lot to do with forming uh, a warp in space time using some technology so they can dimensionally travel, or mm -hmm. travel to an actual physical location through a wormhole. That's what it seems to be to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me as well. Yeah, I always think of anti gravity when I think of Antarctica. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like so, so I think uh, also that uh, because in the past. And we've got lots of uh, civilizations under the water <laughs> from past shifts and ice ages and coming and going. That uh, also with, uh, uh, I believe it was Greenland that had a mammoth frozen suddenly through, it looks like a, a sudden climate change. It could have been caused by a plate tectonic shift uh, or a wobble in the axis that could have caused this. And this is what... Uh, uh, Hapgood, Charles Hapgood believed in his book that Einstein signed on as well. But, you know, if you get a wobble in the uh, in the earth uh, and it, since it's a spinning ball on an axis, you look at any gyroscope, you induce a wobble into it. It goes very unstable for a while until it settles down. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think any passing planet or 
perturber could cause that to the Earth or any other planet for that matter. And so I think that did uh, did happen, and it probably shifted the uh, poles of the Earth relative to the sun, such that uh, the, the where we have the North and South Pole now could very well have been at the equator at some point, and it was the height of the place to live. So I think that's very possible as well. And if we have another shift, it may turn out to be the place to go again. <laughs> so right. somebody may know something. Exactly. Well, that makes a lot of sense right there. And I know when we were, we were on the break there, we talked a little bit about, um, talk about the model. I, I don't know if you want to go into the levels of it or, or where you want to begin with that, but I think it would be good to explore that area um, with the Emerald Tablets and, and Thoth. Okay. Uh, well, I think a lot of people have heard about the Emerald Tablets and maybe they've read them, maybe they haven't. Um, there's about, there's 15 of them, the way they're broken up now that are released on the internet. And also from Dorial, who wrote the book and published the Emerald Tablets. The version that I included in my book, uh, Seventh Planet, were exactly the same ones as, as that one. Uh, the story goes that these, uh, that Thoth, while he was in Egypt, after leaving Atlantis when it was destroyed, he arrived there approximately, um, he left Atlantis, according to his writings, 50,000 years ago, landed in uh, the land of Kem and essentially established Egyptian civilization there. After 16,000 years of ruling him, he went back into what he calls his little stasis state. So we actually used his writings to date the building of the pyramids, which he claimed he did, and several other uh, issues. Well, in the Emerald Tablets, he, he gets very, very deep into differentiating energy and matter and the construct of a human. It's like, if you read this from the standpoint that the creator of all gave you some sort of life book and here's what you're made of and here's your mission and here's what I expect from you. It's all in the Emerald Tablets, if you look mm -hmm. at it from that standpoint. It's amazing. So in, so in those tablets, he starts talking about uh, complex things later on, uh, tablets five, six, seven in that region, where he starts breaking down uh, this concept of these cycles that regulate time on Earth and consciousness. And apparently there were a total of nine, which coincided with the nine Mayan underworld frequencies. And he only listed seven of them being active in this dimension because the other two dimensions were at a lower state and they didn't require those cycle masters to be here, right? So, <laughs> so it went from uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like that. So there were seven of them. He called them the seven lords of the seven cycle masters that apparently came here with according to him, 32 other avatars that saw that all of the humanity that had been created by the Elohim or the Anunnaki were enslaved in this system. And it was their mission. They decided to free them. And Thoth ended up being a later addition to these 32 uh, when he was initiated by them with his father, Poseidon, or the dweller of Atlantis in the records. Okay, so let's, let's, so let's get past some of that. Let's talk about this holographic model that that the, they seem to have set up. So I mentioned that the Anunnaki viewed uh, the, the, the creator of all as this being that was higher than anyone else and lived in this circle of light. That's how they described it. And Thoth lays it out for us. And we'll start from the earth and kind of go back up to the higher dimensions so you can kind of get an idea of how he laid it out for us. And it's much better to look at the diagram. I've put it on my Facebook page and other places. And I'll probably make it available to you, Solaris, so that you can give it to your people if they ask for it, okay? Excellent. Thank you. But I did but I did not include this diagram in my book. It came after I had read the tablets over and over and over before I finally <laughs> put this picture out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, starting from the Earth, apparently we're enveloped by three layers of a boundary, which is, appear to correlate with the Van Allen belt. These are energetic boundaries that even if you left your body as an energy state, you could not penetrate these unless you did it at a place what he called the duot or the portal. Okay, And this portal is a guarded portal so that beings that have been enslaved in avatar bodies on this planet, they can't get in or they can't get out without going through a check system. That's essentially the way it's set up. So uh, he tells us that if you, actually, if you get to the place where you can have an out-of-body experience, and he explains how to do this, that you are to go to this particular place to have an encounter with Osiris, who is guarding that portal. Well, Osiris turns out to be Enki himself, who is the who is uh, uh, Thoth's father. You know, so the dweller of Atlantis has always been known to be Poseidon, and Poseidon is Enki. So somehow, from Egypt to Atlantis, Enki has taken on other avatars, just like Thoth did, 
And he's got one that's guarding the portal to the duot. So what is the duot? We're accordingly in the third dimension, starting with the uh, third cycle master. Remember, remember I told you the other two deal with lower dimensions. So there's a lower dimension he describes as 14 lower dimensions. And they have their own cycle master. And then there's nine parallel dimensions. And they have their own cycle master. And then in our third dimension, we have seven cycle masters that control the dispensation of consciousness that's allowed in this dimension over some period of time based on whenever they're supposed to be merging dimensions and merging consciousness and playing this much higher metagame with awareness than what we're understanding, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's what how Thoth describes them. Is they're, they're basically, and each one has a very specific level of consciousness that they're allowed to control. And it turns out, this is the trippy part, each one of them is assigned to the chakras in your body. The lowest chakra is the third cycle master, and the ninth, and your seventh chakra is assigned to the ninth cycle master. So they're the ones that you get to have spiritual encounters with and tests with to actually ascend to the quantized levels of consciousness, just like the Hindus said in their religion. And they actually named the nine, they named the, the seven uh, gods that they affiliate with those and say the same exact thing that, that Thoth said. So I mm -hmm. thought that was really fantastic. So now all of a sudden you realize, okay, so you're in this, uh, on the earth, surrounded by layers of dimension so that even if you were separated from your body, you couldn't get out. And he tells you specifically the only way to do that is to approach the duot. And there's a little test there that he gives you in order to, you say something to the effect of, and by the time you do this, he's telling you, if you don't, if you have not activated your ba spirit, there's a ba and a ka. The ba mm -hmm. is the is the ticket, it's the key given to you by the creator of all, because we, we were spawned as beings through Anki, retaining our spark connection back to the creator of all. That Ba energy is your ticket to get through the Duat, okay? You can't get through it if you, don't, if you haven't awakened it. And, uh, and everybody in the hologram, especially in the, the Earth prison hologram, it's a, mm -hmm. it, it, consider it a skewed perception prison inside the grand hologram that was created by the creator of all who lives in the circle of light in the ninth dimension. Okay. So you're trapped in here. And the only way out is for you to activate your Ba energy, over, overcome the illusion of the skewed perception prison of materialism that you're in so that you can differentiate the energy and matter that makes you up, own that, claim it, such that you now belong to the light. And so essentially you have to say something, uh, I am the light, in me is no darkness, free let me pass through the, the, the duot, something like that, okay? And I wrote the exact words in the book. So, so now here's your way to get in and out. And he warns you if you try to circumvent the duot, there are beings and entities out there in, non in their energy forms that are going to uh, have you for lunch. Mm-hmm. This is the only way out legally, according to them. These, so, so our creators created this for us. Is it right? Is it the proper thing to do? I don't know. If you created a species on a planet, would you quarantine it until you see if it, see if it could get along? Right, until they ascend in consciousness. Yeah, exactly. Right? That, I yeah. think I would do that too. Now, so you go through the duot, which means two. So you have a connection to the third dimension. The other side is the connection to their fourth dimension, which is where they say the houses of illusion are set up, 12 of them. So there's some sort of little uh, other out-of-body, extra-dimensional test you go through once you reach this dimension. And if you make it through that, then there are 15 pathways, according to that, to Thoth, from the fifth dimension that go to eat, that goes to the sixth dimension, what they call a Rulu. Now, I don't know if that maps to Orion or some other place, or if they just used a different name for a constellation that we call something else. I don't know. Truly, I don't know. But they said... Uh, he says that if you get to that point, that you will be allowed six hours to visit Arulu in the sixth dimension, and then you'll come back through the portal back into your body. And anybody, he invites anyone, he wants you to do this so you can see what he views as your destiny as a higher dimensional being while you're still alive. That's what he mm -hmm. wants you to do. So I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So above the sixth, now in the sixth dimension, it's split up where uh, it looks like the Lord of Light and the Lord of Darkness occupy that house. And among, also, all the old Egyptian gods are mentioned uh, living there on Arulu, including Thoth, that's where his home would be if he hadn't stayed here in this dimension to deal with our enslavement, according to him. Okay? So, 
So I'm not sure if that's a, you know exactly where that is, but it's in the sixth dimension. Now, above that, this is where it gets interesting. They said that above this, the sixth dimension are two dimensions of chaos. That's the seventh and the eighth. And so if you watch the uh, gods of Egypt where the supposed Marduk is the, is the god up in heaven that's fighting off this celestial dragon that's chaos and destroys, right. they tell a very similar story in this about having... Um, agents from the sixth and seventh or the sixth dimension that their only job is to fight off and ward off chaos before it destroys the the creator balls hologram mm. trippy very trippy okay yeah. so then the, then you get to the finally to the ninth dimension where they said the circle of light is where the creator of all resides and they attribute two uh major th uh, feats to this creator one of which is the creation of time and the other is the creation of law, the law of creation of matter. And so both of those are described on the diagram. And he talks in depth about these. And Emerald Tablet 10 talks in detail about what is time. And that's absolutely one of my favorites. <laughs> I, I really love that. One, so. Okay, so what else do you want to ask or think about? about well, it's, it's fascinating. You know, when you talk about this, it's, uh, we talked a little bit about how it's a simulated environment, but you, you also touched on it's holographic, and I think that's a really um, a big thing to, to focus on because we're dealing mm -hmm. with energy and consciousness any way you look at it, right? It's just right, about intent. Right, right. And, so and not, do, okay. do you want me to explain the, the, con the, the creator ball's concept yeah, of a hologram? Yeah, if you could, that'd be I great. Okay, this gets a little, this gets a little deep. But uh, hopefully, if I and if I get if I get too deep, let me know, and I'll try to come okay. back to uh, come back to reality. <laughs> okay. So the the two block diagrams that are going to be shown in this in this picture when you see it, there'll be one that says the law of time, the other the law of creation of matter. Well, Emerald Tablet Ten talks about the law of time, and Thoth goes in depth picking the Cycle Master's brain about what is time. Is it is it is it permanent? Uh, what is it? And uh, he gets told that essentially it's a vibration that was that was caused from the void, the but the dark void, the rift where there was no segregation of matter, where the where the ninth dimension is. That cymatic vibration essentially was permanent and created created a carrier wave, if you will, for what we call the concept of time. And I thought that was just fascinating because it turns out that. When you analyze what time is, you can break it down into events. You can break it down into um, sequences of events, stitch, stitch those together, and then say this is the chronology from A to B. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I deal with the complexities of that in Emerald Tablet 10 in my analysis to essentially take you down to what distinguishes a dimension. And, how, and is it a measurement issue or is, there, or is it a analog situation where you can go halfway and never get there? Well, it turns out it's a fundamental of light that we we can approximate dimensional differentiation according to this model. He's like I said, he said there were nine parallel dimensions. Well, these parallel dimensions, according to him, are completely accessible to us in our out of body state if we overcome the construct of time. And he tells you how to do this. He uh, he he treats it as if it's a a wave that if you take a right angle to it relative to your energy body, there's a certain way to overcome time. And at that point, you can jump into other the other nine parallel dimensions and visit them at will, according to him. And I mm -hmm. think uh, after reading Robert Monroe's books, uh, Journeys Out of the Body, he wrote three of them. And I mm -hmm. started reading these when I was 17 because it started happening to me and I didn't really know what was going on. But after reading mm -hmm. those books, I've kind of lived with this my whole life, the, the concept of your energy body being able to be separate from your meat host, your I call it your meat modem, mm -hmm. and actually still retain consciousness and the essence of what, what and who you are. And I, had I not experienced that, I probably wouldn't be so open to this, but uh, I'd experienced it so many times that uh, it was a second nature to me. And I, I guess for millions of other people it is as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like an initiation, if you ask me. A lot of what you're describing, um, it feels like an initiation. You know, also what correlates is, is light body. Where does light body fit into a lot of these um, these types of? Well, as I was telling, uh, yeah, so I, I, I didn't mean to cut you up. I'm sorry. That's okay. No. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, well, this light body. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about this creator of all. We are instances, uh, very special beings that have the sun, soul, spirit of the creator of all. So our essence is light, okay? So when I hear this psyop about, oh, and you die, and stay away from the light because it's a trap, that's, that's crap. Listen, you should be seeking light in this life while you're alive, and especially when you're out of your body. 
Okay. <laughs> light yeah. is from the creator of all. So I want to put that on the table right here, right now. Okay. Okay. And as, as, as somebody who's had an out of body experience, visited uh, all these places, uh, I, I should really write a book about it. But I left yeah. it to Robert Monroe. He did this in three different books and it set up a Monroe Institute where people can actually go get hooked up and have a controlled, spontaneous oob experience under scientific conditions so they can study this phenomenon for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to check out the Moreau Institute when they start thinking this is foo fooey stuff. So did I answer your question about the white body? So well, let me let me go a little bit farther with it. So in okay. Thoth's writings and his teachings, we were born with the Ba energy that's essentially asleep. And I and from what I can tell as being a structural integrator and looking at the human energy body both in the frequency domain and the light domain, which I did, called resonant field imaging and poly contrast interference photography. I can guarantee you people, you have an energy body, okay? <laughs> and at the po at the negative pole of that is your ganglion of empar that sits on the bottom of your coccyx bone, okay? And this is a structural integration principle, uh, and it's also a fact scientifically as it's been measured. That is your negative pole of your energy body if you treated a human like a battery standing up in the gravity field, okay? Mm -hmm. And the top end of that pole is right behind your nose and your sphenopalatine ganglia. A ganglia is a nerve complex, okay? That's what a chakra is. It's a nerve complex where energy seems to aggregate both in sensing and receiving your, your effectors and sensors all over your body, okay? Well, this aggregates at these points and then goes laterally out to your different areas. Well, it turns out that these have frequencies that can be measured that are distinct from one another, which is kind of an interesting concept in and of itself. So in the process of verifying this idea that the seven cycle masters might have something to do with controlling our consciousness. The question for me was, do we have quantized levels of energy in our body that could change as a function of some input that we do, whether it's yoga or <laughs> Reiki healing or just whatever it is? Okay, is that, is, that a, is that the truth? And that search led for me, um, I had my own practice running as a structural integrator with an imaging lab for over seven years. Nice. And I, docu I, saw the, I saw many, many, many energy bodies on my poly contrast system and measured it with my resonant field imaging. Okay, so this is science to me. Well, um, people, uh, I guess what I want to say about that is your light body is a function of the aggregation or the working of all your chakras in conjunction. And so if you've got a body that's been mangled in an accident or your spine isn't straight or the cerebral spinal or your spinal fluid is not able to be pumped up all the way up your cerebellum, you're going to have differences in energy along your antenna than if it was perfect. And nobody's perfect, okay? Gravity is very strong. And unless you're playing an integration game with gravity early in your life, um, it wins every time. So. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a light body is kind of a quantized thing. And what I did is I came up with an equation in my first book, Equation 5. You may have seen it and probably skipped it when you saw, when you saw it, mm -hmm. but it was a bunch of math equation stuff. But the end result is our energy body does have a maximum, and it's measurable, and it's a function of weight, gravity, wavelength, and frequency that make up the energy that composes your chakras. And there may be more, there may be more to it, too, as well. I mean, we're just now learning about different states of matter and other energy forms and how they interact with us. But just from a rudimentary Newtonian physics world, Einstein's world, um, that equation shows that you got seven chakras, and if they're not all on, you're not going to have an optimal energy experience. So your light body is going to be quantized at the level that you are able to achieve in this life. And really, for me, that ought to be the thing that you're focused on. When I said seeking light, I meant seeking the light to light your, your chakras up so they're all on and working in this experience while you're still alive. That's mm -hmm. the best thing you could ever, ever do with your time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, unifying the chakra system. That's what I, I like to do anyway. But yeah, absolutely. We're going to hit a break here in a second. And also, um, we have a question in the chat, but we'll get back to that when we, we okay. return from the break, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. But let, before we hit the break, let everybody know how to purchase your books. And also, you have them. You're signing your books, so that's really nice on your website, right? Yeah, I've got uh, we've both we've got two stores on GeraldClark77.com, G-E-R-A-L-D-C-L-A-R-K 77.com, and also on ArtisticVegan.com. That's my wife's website. On there, we have stores where you can purchase pretty much all of our products, genealogy tables, so you can uh, have a something to talk about with your friends when you put this door size thing up on your wall. Um, USBs with audiobooks for both of my books, and I also have signed paperback books uh, for people as well. And of course, all my stuff's available on Amazon. Uh, that you, if you search for Gerald Clark, you'll see all my listings. Greetings, all. This is Gerald Clark on November 24, 2017. 
Recently, the efforts to complete the trailer for the screenplay, Odyssey Key, were transitioned to the next phase, which is marketing. Thus, the GoFundMe campaign will continue to facilitate completing the movie-making goal. Since first writing my book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, in 2013, hundreds of hours of video and free content have been shared with the online community, and that effort will continue. Seventh Planet Broadcasting is excited to announce that premium content will now be available directly from me, Gerald Clark. Maintaining the research and providing new content will be significantly bolstered by supporting my work in this manner. Topic ranges to be covered will be numerous with the added enthusiasm to provide the latest, most relevant content for subscribers. The premium content offering will include new interviews, podcasts, multimedia series, status updates, and more. So I want to thank you all for, that have supported me and my research to this point and my efforts to empower humanity along their unique life odyssey path. Thank you very much.